Amen. Our political system have failed us. Our political system have failed us. Now we need to be looking for a system of love. A language of love. A language. That's God's name. Yes. Love. God is logo. Wow. If you can't talk this, you can't understand it. Mm -hmm. So he got to give us supernatural thinking. We all need to hear it in a language in which we are born. Okay, we're ready well, then. Before we get started, um, Pastor Eric, well, I'll call you Pastor Eric. I'm, um, I, I hope that that's okay. Um, you're good. You're good. You're okay. good. <laughs> um, we're just so thankful to have you. And we love to hear um, your testimony, how um, God, uh, he snatched you up. Mm hmm and, and, and brought you to this point. And we yeah. know you could talk about that for five hours, but we want you to talk about five minutes for that because we want you to wake us up. To wake <laughs> yes, us sir. Up. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you for the prophetic rebuke. All right. Um, <laughs> um, so um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., um, son of uh, two... Uh, people who grew up in the South, in uh, South Carolina. Um, my mom and dad were raised by first generation free slaves. And um, my dad was a World War II vet, Korean War vet, Buffalo soldier, two Purple Hearts. Mama was a day's worker. <clears throat> and so I grew up in that type, in the inner city of DC during the heroin epidemic in the seventies and then post uh, heroin and PCP epidemic. And then from there, the crack epidemic. Um, grew up in the church and was kind of catechized, but didn't really have, um, didn't really, didn't understand the gospel. Went to college, um, fall of my sophomore year, heard the gospel for the first time and was rocked by the gospel, got my call to gospel ministry in the next, basically the next year or so, uh, received my call to ministry, went to Dallas Seminary, uh, um, got married at, at, during that time. Uh, worked at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship for a while, uh, worked in Houston at the oldest church in Houston, came back to Oak Cliff, went out, planted, uh, planted, ended up uh, going to a residency, planted a church in Philadelphia, and we planted 44 churches across the nation, uh, across the globe. So everywhere from uh, Malawi, Africa, we planted about 30 churches in Malawi, Africa, in Uganda, uh, South Central LA, right around the corner where uh, Nipsey Hussle died, um, Brooklyn and Bed-Stuy, where Jay-Z is from, Wilmington, Delaware, near the, where the Delaware massacre happened uh, uh, years ago, um, Baltimore, Maryland, not too far from where Freddie Gray uh, was murdered. Uh, and we have, everybody, they're gonna kill me. I can't remember. Gloucester City, New Jersey, it's our first white plant among poor whites by a white guy. So we planted a white guy among poor whites who's doing community development and church planting among poor whites. Um, and I got, in, LA is a white guy planting multi-ethnically among all, it's the most diverse church in our network. So, I mean, I can keep going, but that's it. Like I wanna, uh, but that's that's kind of a, uh, a framework. And right now we're working on a lot of initiatives. So I'd like to first off thank um, Dr. Perkins and the team for bringing me on here. I am beyond honored to be here. I am beyond honored to uh, have the privilege to be able, I don't even understand why I'm talking in front of him, you know, um, because he has so much to share. Uh, those nuggets, uh, he was, you know, he, he doesn't know he's a rapper, but he, he what he was just doing just now, that's MC stuff we call, in my generation, we call that bars. So um, uh, 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 Pop Perk got some bars um, that he was spitting. So spitting don't mean he was spitting. It just means he was rapping for those who don't know. <laughs> uh, so um, anyway. Um, Northwest Pasadena, they called him OG. OG, OGP, OGP. That's, that's <laughs> But yeah, so we are thankful. And uh, for my first time, um, Miss Perkins, so glad to see you on here we're keeping you in our prayers um so good to finally see your face um it is wonderful to see your face and my wife and i will be praying for you and the family thank you all for the family legacy that you have if know him know me uh that's that's what i say no no uh dr john m perkins 
know me. <clears throat> so what I'm about to teach, I have 30 minutes and I want to maximize that time. Uh, I, I, I fall in the legacy of men like Dr. John Perkins, uh, Francis Grimke, <laughs> uh, um, uh, Crawford Loritz, Dr. Tony Evans, Sam B. Sam Hart, uh, Tom Skinner, all of those men, and I know uh, Pop Perk, know all of these men, um, and know what I mean when I say that I fall under their lineage of investment. Um, one of the things in an African American community, um, being uh, raised up in that environment and society. Um, you want to you want to be faithful to the scriptures and and faithful also to not forget the context that you need to engage. And so as we dive in, I, I, I think I have screen. Oh, they gave me screen sharing capacity already. Amen. <clears throat> and so um, during this little little bit of time, I want to talk about this subject. Um, I, a few years ago, many of you, of course, know that I, I wrote a book called Woke Church, and people always ask me. What made you write that book? And the thing that made me write that book was, um, it, uh, they said, uh, it took 40 years, over 40 years for me to write the book. Um, and I wrote it because I saw every 20 to 30 or so years, there becomes a, a racial unrest in our country. Uh, the, the, if you look at the early eight, 1900s, there was racial unrest before that. Uh, was racial unrest. After that, it was it, it was more racial unrest towards uh, the 40s and 50s. Then from there to the 60s, and then from the 60s to the in the 70s through the end of the 80s. And now, years later, it's uh, 20, 30 years later, we have another intense battle. And um, uh, people in in the name of the living God have to have several things put in their life, as Carl Ellis would say. They need significance, dignity, and identity. Let me say that again. They need the affirmation of significance, dignity, and identity. Whether you're saved or not, every believer grows, uh, every believer is um, born, with, every person is born with that. And so when being born with that reality, um, because of the racial stream in our country that, like Dr. Perkins said earlier, we've created that monster. That monster has been created years and years ago. I would say the stream of uh, of racial brokenness, we don't have time to go over it, and, uh, uh, and, and cultural imperialism started with Constantinianism. <laughs> started with Constantinianism and Islam and, and, and Moors. That's a, uh, th that, that's a whole nother discussion. But fast forward to today, the legacy of that finds itself in our country. And so in light of a lot of African-American deaths that have happened in the streets, uh, that happened because of um, they, they, they were not uh, there, there, there were some just shootings and there were a ton of unjust ones right and so in light of that reality um, there's been a real a, a, a reawakening in the natural of a need for the challenging of the split and the racial divide that happened in our country and so for me as a believer I believe that Christians should be the wokest people on the planet um, when I say woke, I don't mean uh, Afro, I don't mean the other, the, the, the worldly woke. I'm talking about the woke that's in the lineage of W.E.B. Du Bois, where he had a double consciousness theory. This double consciousness theory, if you look in the souls of black folk, was awareness, it was awareness, first off, to how blacks were perceived by whites in the world and blacks' self-perception. But then I added a third one in it, and <clears throat> um God consciousness, as you will, not new age God consciousness, but conscious of the things of God, which takes us to Ephesians uh, chapter four, of, I mean, chapter five, verse 16. <clears throat> it's, uh, it says, get up sleeper, arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. I'm reading from the CSB. And the word get up is some translations will translate it <clears throat> awake, right? Awake, awake. And that idea is where I get woke from uh, in another tense, um, because believers are supposed to be awakened first to two main realities. The first reality that a believer is awakened to is the holiness of God. The second thing the believer must be awakened to <clears throat> is the brokenness of man. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be awakened to the fact that God is holy, 
and that there's no one that can attain to his holiness. On the other side, um, the brokenness and fallenness of man. In that reality, we awaken to the fact that only Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, <clears throat> can cross the gap between God's holiness and man's sinfulness and merge to bring man and God together without changing God into man and without changing man into God, but changing man in order that man and God can get together. That's the, the, that's the only awakening needed. <laughs> now, that awakening through the gospel is the mechanism by which we're able to see everything in the world. <clears throat> when we talk about the fact that we say awake sleeper and rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you, what we're beginning to see is now you're supposed to be able to see the world with redemptive eyes. That's why verse 15 says, be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but wise. The, the word there for wise is the Greek word Sophia. Um, its cousin word in Tanakh or the Old Testament is the Hebrew word chokmah. Somebody say chokmah. You ain't got to unmute. Just say chokmah. You know a little bit of Hebrew now. And so in light of... Um, the idea of the word chokmah, it means to it means the application of knowledge, the ability to live out what you know. What the gospel gives you the ability to do is to be able to see the gaps in culture, but also to be able to live out what you know. In light of this passage, the practical reality of what the what Paul is talking about is what does it look like in the world for the church to bring peace? That's why he says making the most of the opportunity, redeeming the time. What does it mean to redeem times? Redeeming times is the church actively <clears throat> uh, showing the coming kingdom in culture, listen, in such a way that we do what's called peace. Peace in the Greek is arene, but preached in the Old Testament is shalom. Shalom means restitching things back to God's order and God's design. Let me say that again. Restitching things back to God's order and design. When we redeem the times, we, we utilize God's resources for glorious things in the earth. So now, when we look at that and apply it here to the issue of racial injustice, Jesus says, you tithe dill, you tithe mint, you tithe cumin, uh, but you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have done these without neglecting the others. So now, what do we see ourselves now in relation to that? How do we apply? Jesus gives us a justice hermeneutic. I talked about this the other day. What do, what do we mean about justice hermeneutic? Well, Jesus gives us clues on how to read the Bible. He says, you search the scriptures for you think in them you find eternal life, but they all speak of me. Meaning Jesus says, go to the Old Testament and in the law, prophets and writings, look for me. But not only does he say that, he says, um, you should have neglected in your hermeneutics of scripture, justice, faithfulness, and mercy. So he gives us the ability to understand justice from that perspective, looking at justice um, in Tanakh just means uh, living life according to God's ethics, right? So, so when we go through here, and we go through here, we begin to look at, let me see if I can, there we go. When we talk about woke, I've quoted some of this already. When I say woke, and when we say woke, this is what we mean. We believe being woke is spiritual. You got to be transformed by the gospel got to be transformed by the gospel. Number two, it's personal because it causes you to have to pay attention and take responsibility for what's needed. It's relational. It's relational. It's relational. It has to do with the engagement of actual people. Uh, whether you're talking about the Good Samaritan, it's relational, right? Right? And even we can add structural because, well, that's in the social piece of things. But when you look at social, because this is the one that everybody's pushing about, you know, everybody's pushing, how we're pushing cr uh, critical race theory and pushing Marxism. Well, maybe, uh, well, let's look at, let's look at a couple of verses on this. Isaiah chapter one, verse 17, pursue justice, correct the oppressor, defend the rights of the fatherless, plead the widow's case. Now, um, people that utilize CRT and talk about ethnic Gnosticism, and, and Marxism are only using what I call cultural grenades to, un, to undermine biblical theology. 
biblical theology, because they don't want to do anything about the racial justice divide, they want to throw grenades. Because if you ask those same people that are talking about CRT and they're talking about Marxism, you ask them, what are you doing to bring unity among the ethnicities? And they can't tell you anything because they want to maintain their own status quo, amen, lights and walls. And so because they want to, because they want to maintain their status quo, they have to develop a false theology to continue the division. They say, well, talking about race, why are you talking about race? That divides us. The, uh, listen, first off, <laughs> I, 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 whew, help me today, God. When you're talking about, when you talk about dividing us, racism already divides, divides us. Calling out sin is movement towards unity, not breaking away and causing division. That's why in Ephesians chapter four, <clears throat> we were talking about this the other day. People talking about we need to be unified. Ephesians four said we're already unified. Jesus's death already made us positionally unified. It's us who's practically dividing us in every area of life. And so when we talk about the reality of this in relation to being woke meaning social, you can also turn over to one of my favorite verses on this. Um, it is Isaiah chapter 10, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 1 and 2 says, Woe to those enacting crooked statutes and writing oppressive laws to keep the poor from getting a fair trial and to deprive the needy among my people of justice so that the widows can be their spoil and they can plunder the fatherless. Can you believe that that's in the Bible? I put that out on my page. I put that out on my page and unbelievers couldn't even believe that it was in the Bible. I mean, they said, I didn't know the Bible actually spoke to very, very practical issues in our culture. I said, if you get in the Bible and stop being, so you, you say Christians are judgmental, you haven't even read the Bible and you're being judgmental of the Bible. And so why don't you dive into the Bible and see what God has to say about so many different things. And so being woke is spiritual, it's personal, it's relational, it's social, and it's eschatological. Eschatological, meaning when Jesus returns, Jesus is going to fully put us in our full state of what he's called us to be in with our new bodies, our glorified bodies, glorified soul and spirit merged together with him forever, and we will be eternally with him forever. So let's give a practical definition as well. All right, I'm going to push this up so I can see it. Hold on. All right, there we go. So when we look at this, when we say woke, we're talking about having a systemic awareness of what the racial injustice issues of our day are and mobilizing the church to do several things. Mobilizing the church to do seven, uh, several things. First, mobilizing the church to see justice through gospel eyes. One of the most um, undeveloped doctrines in the church is the doctrine of Imago Dei, Imago Christi, and the doctrine of partiality, impartiality. When I say Imago Dei, the fact that all of us are born in the image of God. But then Imago Christi, Romans 8, 29, um, God predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ, Imago Christi, meaning now that you become a believer, you're not only image of God, you're image of Christ to image God the best. A to the doggone man. From there, we look at the practical outworkings of Imago Christi, Imago Dei, by looking at the doctrine of partiality, impartiality. James talks a lot about that, says a practical application of your justification is the way you practice fulfilling the law and how you treat other people, no matter their ethnicity and no matter their economic status. That's what James chapter one and chapter two uh, uh, pushes us into, right? Um, but also um, doing this and being aware, how do we get aware of these things Number two is we have to do our homework. The Bible says the sons of Issachar were men who knew the times and knew what Israel ought to do. There's a there's a there's an adjectival hendiatus there. It's called uh, 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 I mean a verbal hendiatus. It's, it's yadah banach, which which points to the reality 
of, 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 of knowing and understanding together is potently pointing to the fact that the sons of Issachar understood culture and what was going on in the world, but it also understood intensely God's word. What we have to do as believers is we have to know what's going on in culture. One of the things that, I, and we have to know our Bible. That doesn't mean we let our understanding of culture influence our Bible. We let our understanding of culture help us ask biblical questions that the Bible's able to answer any cultural question, but we let our biblical understanding influence our cultural engagement. So when we look at that reality, again, talking about what does that look like, that means um, if you, you're not going to be a good missionary in this culture if you're not watching The Breakfast Club. You got to watch The Breakfast Club. <laughs> and you got to be in your Bible. The Breakfast Club is, I mean, cross-ethnically, cross-ethnically, one of the most contemporary engaging things in our culture today, right? And so that helps us to know what things people are asking in culture. Um, if you listen, this, this generation is heavily theological. They're not biblical theological, but they have a theology. And in order to engage and answer those questions, that has to happen. And when it comes to the particularly, there's not one Breakfast Club interview with Charlemagne and Angela Yee and DJ Envy that comes up. Most of them, a lot of them focus a lot on culture, a lot on politics, and a lot on race. And it's a helpful tool for us to understand who are we engaging and who's pastoring this generation. Let me say that again. Who's pastoring this generation, right? So I can go on and on and on about that. But also we got to speak prophetically to the issues of injustice in our culture. You know, everybody read, most churches, they read Proverbs 31 and they start at verse 10. <laughs> but Proverbs 31 don't start at verse 10. We want to always apply Proverbs 31 to womanhood only, but in the, the, the true context of Proverbs isn't about women's ministry. The true context of Proverbs is a mother talking to a son about wisdom at its best. The, the, the point of the end of Proverbs is the climax is to say wisdom at its best is a woman acting wisely. That's what wisdom personified looks like. In verse 8 and 9, you have a mama. Some people think Lemuel is a nickname for Solomon. And that his mother is talking to him and is, is, is engaging him and is challenging him, crazily enough, about, um, a, a, about when he becomes king and the fact that he, he must not forget about the poor, but he must be a voice for the voiceless. That's what the church it's called to do. That's what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to be a voice for the voiceless. That is our prophetic call. We have to go from pathetic ministry to prophetic ministry. Let me say that again. We must go from pathetic ministry to prophetic ministry. That means we have to call out the powers in a way that still respects the powers like Romans 13 says and Titus chapter 3 says. But on the other hand, we have to be Johannine or, or, or John the Baptist in our engagement, Jesus-like in our engagement, Pauline in our engagement, Isaiah-like in our engagement, and Hosea-like in our engagement, and Amos-like in our invade, in, in engagement. Respect yet challenge. We are, the church is called to be the conscience of whatever society that it's in. It's called to be the soul of the society that it's in. If you, you, you got to think, think of culture as your, as your own life. When you get saved, your, your soul is saved, but your body ain't saved yet. <laughs> it's yet to be saved. The church is the soul within the body of every culture that is supposed to push against the flesh of the culture to push it to in, be engaged and sanctified by the power of the living God. And so, let me see where my cursor is. Oh, there it is. Um, and then we got to find strategic ways to engage those issues. One of the things we have to do with that is we have to find, the church has to find strategic ways to engage those issues. So one of the things that Isaiah 58 says, listen, the fast that I desire is not you just fasting and, and being in, in church all the time. He says, no, I want you to do justice as a practice of what fasting looks like. 
And so in our society, in our context, we're going, we're continuing gospel proclamation, but they've closed all the schools in our section of Philadelphia, closed all of the, um, the high schools in the section of Philadelphia we're ministering in. All the high schools are closed. And so they're packing kids in the classrooms, but they've taken, they, they, they've dropped the, the school budget in Philadelphia among African-Americans and Latinos. They dropped it a half a billion dollars, about $400 million. And they increased the prison budget by $800 million. But that doesn't, that only impacts the black communities and brown communities. It does not impact the white communities. And people say the racism still doesn't exist. <laughs> they say it still doesn't, it does. Look, 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 at what, look at what Paul says in Titus. He says, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works for pressing needs so they will not be unfruitful. Good works as a theme throughout the book of Titus. Many people go to Titus chapter three for regeneration, but they don't go there for transformation. Regeneration is in chapter three, but at the end of that, it talks about uh, 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 um, doing good works, doing good works. What are some pressing needs for African-Americans? First off, church leaders need to wake up. Church leaders need to wake up. The church is no longer seen in this fight, you all, family, as the catalyst to engage the world or the leader of it. The people talking about, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, all lives matter. And then they talk about, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement support this, this, that, and the third. When we talk about the Black Lives Matter organization, I don't support the Black Lives Matter organization. I support the mantra Black Lives Matter as a movement because the Bible supports Black Lives Matter in the sense of all people created equal and includes Black people. And we need to affirm the dignity of Black people. So we don't, we don't, we don't, I, I don't support Marxism and the redefinition of the family. So don't lump me in there because I say Black Lives Matter. They ate to the dog on men. How, 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 however, when we look at this reality, church needed, we're in here fighting and, and, and the people, listen, know who should have started Black Lives Matter? The church. Know who should have been the first to have signs up across the nation? The church. The church should have. The church should have said it before everyone else. And people say, uh, you know, well, there's no such thing as the black church. And I tell them this, and this is my response. I said the black church exists because the white church refused to be the church. Therefore, the black church had to come into existence. <laughs> but now it's our time as the church to lament this together and begin to help church leaders to wake up and stop arguing about whether or not racism. It is the most intellectually disingenuous thing to say that racism doesn't exist. It's, it, I don't even know what planet someone's on. If you believe in the sinfulness of man, it's impossible to say that racism doesn't exist in high proportions. But only that, we need biblical literacy. One of the things we need to add to our basic Bible doctrines is the doctrine of justice and imago day. We need to add those things in fleshing it out, because I think a lot of, and, uh, because in, in doing that, we will have our people to be intellectually and spiritually prepared for stuff. I really think because we're we're more discipled in patriotism in America than we are uh, 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 the, the great potentate himself, what ends up happening is, is when issues like this come up, there's resistance because people don't have the discipleship acumen, the intellectual, biblical, and theological framework to even have a house to be able to engage what we're talking about. So we have to have biblical literacy, the affirmation of black dignity, we talked about that. We have to have a visible street presence. We have to have systemic outreach. One of the things that we're doing, we have three levels of outreach in our church, uh, 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 blitzes, connections, and city investments. When we talk about city investments, that's our systemic outreach. And systemic outreach, when you're talking about ministering to the whole person, um, I have to disciple people and engage them with the truth of the word of God, but I also have to help them with housing, not poverty perpetuating things like just giving out food and giving out clothing. Those are emergency things, but that doesn't help systemically change people's condition. And so for, for us, bringing the kingdom to an area looks like what we're doing now is we have to help kids with coding, how to, how to, how to develop uh, beats in the studio, how to mix down an album how to do media production, okay? 
Uh, we're doing a business planning center, developing a school there, a uh, 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 daycare center for moms. It's a food desert. So we're looking, we're doing a grocery store and a beauty supply store, all those different things. And those things, as we develop common ground, Bible says in Colossians chapter four, act with wisdom towards outsiders, knowing how to respond to each person, making the most of the opportunity. If we're going to be fruitful and engage in meeting pressing needs, we have to minister to the whole person because the gospel changes all of life. Uh, church transitions, some old, some older seasoned guys that are in the church. That's why I love what uh, Dr. Perkins is doing is he's trying to engage many of us to, to step up in the gap of where he's one day going to transition out of, which is beautiful. But some people in church spheres don't know how to pass the torch. And what ends up happening is the culture around them changes, the needs around them change, but they remain the same. And the church begins to decrease in relevance and engagement while everything else grows up around them. And instead of having the humility to make disciples and put someone else in place, what ends up happening is, is the, the witness of the church in communities and in situations begin to decrease. And then we also need new churches. Not only that, how am I doing on time? How am I doing on time? I'm doing good on time? Okay. Going. Okay. Um, we uh, and we gotta also um, deal with people who are dealing with church hurt. One of the most things um, that, that that we're finding in this generation, and particularly when it comes to the church's level of engagement of different things, is engaging church hurt. Another great problem that's happening in our communities, family of God, is that because the church has been has has not filled in the gap of black identity there are other groups that are coming up as false doctrines to affirm the church the black people's identity the first of them is hebrew israelites some of y'all never seen these people before <laughs> y'all never seen these type of people before i know you have i know you have and they they're out there trying to affirm black dignity while we're fussing about black dignity and blacks are being engaged by Hebrew Israelites, comedic and African ideologies. I'm not demonizing Africa, so don't hear me saying that. But I'm talking about African spiritualities are trying to, you have uh, a lot of black women going into Yoruba spirituality who said they grew up in the church. Like a lot of people don't know that Eliana Van Zandt is a, is a Yoruba priestess. She's not a Christian. And a lot of the stuff that she does on her show is Yoruba is Yoruba stuff. Uh, I have a person on my staff. She's a clinical PhD psychologist. And, um, and and prior to being a Christian, she was a Yoruba priestess. And now she's a robust uh, uh, minister of the gospel. She's on our staff. And uh, uh, she's over women's ministry. She's over small groups. She, so she leads our small group ministry. And she talks about all of the things in Aliana, what she does that's, that's really... Yoruba stuff, not Christian stuff, but it's syncretism. And so today we have a lot of spiritual syncretism, but because black people are so hungry for identity, they're grabbing anywhere that affirms their blackness, even if it's a mythological ideology. The church has to step in and show that the gospel does affirm black affirms everybody's identity but we can't say well it's here to affirm everybody's identity everybody in america hasn't had their identity raped like black people has and so it's unfair to try to teach to, to try to engage dignity development equally when there hasn't been equal destruction of it right and so these people are are are, are people that are i had a debate at my church with the guy on the right with the glasses his name is jabbar he got smashed by vince bantu in the debate over christianity being a white man's religion do you know that's like a huge thing right now that black people think that christianity is epistemologically and cosmologically made for white people and that it was birthed at nasir and all of those old philosophical views that have been destroyed. And we've been out here doing what's called urban apologetics. That's my next book that's coming out. And we've had to show that, 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 that no, 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 no. The church fathers were not white men. Uh, they, 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 the, the first, the church fathers were Africans. <laughs> Europe did not first evangelize Africa. 
Africa evangelized Europe. <laughs> and, 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 and somebody said, what does it matter? It matters because history has been painted white. Jesus has been, been painted white. I love you, baby. Um, uh, uh, Jesus has been painted white. Uh, everything, and I love you too, sweetheart. I love you too, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you. Everything, everything has been painted white. And so what happens now is Blacks say, well, that has to be a white man's religion. And so what we have to do is we have to recall. We're not saying paint all of history Black. We're just saying be true about what history actually looked like so that we can show that Christianity is a global religion. Let's talk about the fact of how Christianity grew in China centuries ago. Let's talk about how it grew in uh, Algeria and Congo years ago. Let's talk about how it grew in Russia. Let's talk about how it grew in all of these different places. Let's talk about how Mansa Musa, the richest African king in history, was uh, uh, had Christians in his empire in the 1300s who were African and that he possibly was a Christian himself. And so why, why are those things important? Because black dignity, it, it means including global history in history, not just um, not just having history uh, be uh, 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 from, from white folks' perspective. I can keep on on that all day. Um, next, the Moors, esoteric spiritual, same thing. Nation of Islam is making a, a, an increase back, right? Right? All of these groups, these are problem groups. This is a new one called Aboriginals. This guy here um, uh, uh, is it, big on, he has hundreds of thousands of views. He's, you know, uh, Nation of Islam say we're from the tribe of Jabal. Uh, Shabbat, Jabbat. Uh, uh, the African spirituality people say we're Egyptian. Uh, 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 um, <laughs> the Hebrew Israelites say we're, we're the original Jews. Um, the, Abor the Aboriginal guys say we are from America. See how everybody's trying to define our identity uh, uh, and, and, and why the church has to come in and do biblical, theological, and historical analysis and help this to happen. These are the results of the problem of racism in our country. And this generation, I pastor, I'm not talking as a dude that pastors a church uh, 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 of, of senior citizens. I passed a church of 90% millennials and Gen Zs, and these are the issues. They are very influenced by YouTube. They're not reading like they, like we used to. YouTube is their reading. Memes is their reading. <laughs> and, so, and so now the church has to attack that. So when we talk about this reality, this is in my book. One of the things, and I'll get ready to close in about five minutes because I know my time is winding down because there's so much I can say. But when we look at these sectors, you can look Take at this. Your time. Take your time. <laughs> okay. And so um, you can look in these sectors. And one of the things that you'll see in these sectors that I've developed, these are, this is like a working document. Um, so uh, so and this is the whole W.E.B. Du Bois and I <clears throat> put in there what gospel wokeness looks like, gospel wakefulness looks like. Um, and, and ultimately, those are different quadrants of where um, different Christians, uh, particularly Black Christians, are, you know. And so this chart is to help people to be, and I'm not going to go through this chart, but if you want to look at the chart, you can grab the book, you can get it on, it's on Kindle as well. And it'll help you to have a framework for these types of things. And I'll explain it a lot more in that resource, right? So we look at how long we've been American yeah, slavery. Right. Then we look at segregation and we look at where we are now. We've had less time in that. So what does the woke church have to do? We have to be awake. We have to be willing to acknowledge. We have to be accountable and we have to be active. In light of that reality, um, let me go back up. Uh, how do I go back up? Let me see, there we go. Um, Again, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works for pressing needs so that we will not be unfruitful. Learn meaning a part of our discipleship must include learning the contextual needs of our community as a missional community. Just a few things. What has the black church particularly done? And the reason why I bring up the black church is because the black church has been a leader in, um, in these issues in the past. Um, created institutions for people. There's been banks. When there was redlining, they created banks uh, and credit unions, black colleges and universities, life leadership training for the next generation, like Grimke did, right? Uh, produced the greatest leaders of the 21st century, 20th century. 
what is the black church doing now? Developing L housing for the elderly, college scholarships, uh, drug treatment programs, school adoption and mentoring, daycare, developing low income housing. So where can we grow? We need to grow in this area, connecting with the current and up upcoming generations. In the book of Haggai, without going into it too deeply, during the second temple period, there was a generational divide. That generational divide, based on Ezra chapter three, verses 12 through 13, God had the new generation redeveloping the temple, but there was a generation that remembered the Salmonic temple. In their memory of the Salmonic, yes? Oh, you said some. Uh, okay. okay. Um, in their memory of the Salmonic temple, the older generation didn't view the temple that was being built in the second temple period after the captivity in Babylon and Persia as up to par with their generation's building of the temple. But God said, the context of Haggai 2.9 is, God said the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. In other words, God said the glory that I want to bring in this new temple that's smaller and less exquisite than the first temple is going to be greater than Solomon's temple, which was a great temple in its own right. But as we know in Ezekiel, the glory left the temple. But later on, after the 400 years of silence, uh, in, a, in, about, uh, in, about, uh, uh, um, in about 2 AD, a toddler walked into the temple with his parents and they had two turtle doves and pigeons. And they did, and they did uh, a, a, a sacrifice. And no one knew that inconspicuously, the glory of God had returned to that temple because Jesus Christ came and he came to restore and be the temple that we were always supposed to be so that he could die the death live the life that we can never live and die the death that we can never die, get up from the grave that we can never get up from and then help us apply these realities in our world. So connecting to the current crisis, create touch points. We have to, that's why we got to grow. We have to create touch points from a practical standpoint. We got to get out into our neighborhood. When we get out into our neighborhood, I'm talking about from a systemic perspective in our community, we ask three questions in our community. Every, every time we get a chance, three questions. The first question, the first question we ask is, what are the three greatest influences in this community? Then we ask, what are the three greatest needs? And then we ask, what can the church do to put a dent in those needs? And those type of questions, let me say that again. What are the three greatest influences? What are the three greatest needs? And what can the church do to put a dent in those great needs? One of the things that we find when we do that is the church learns a lot about the community. We record them and then we have a Wednesday night time where we share those things with the church through video and audio. And you will be blown away by many times churches are in communities and don't know the needs of those communities. And so one of the things in communities like ours, we try to educate our church, not just through me bringing stats to the church, but helping them to actually get known the needs of the church. And so I'm gonna get ready to close on that, but us being in the inner city community, um, my, my, our vision and our passion, our vision, our passion has been to plant churches in places where no one wants to go, but there's a great opportunity for gospel fruit, right? And our basis for that is Acts chapter 14, verses 21 through 25, where it says, and they preached the gospel to that entire city. They made disciples and appointed the leader, appointed elders and commended them to the grace of God. We want to have ministry that does that. We uh, uh, leading out with church planning and gospel proclamation, but also meeting pressing needs, community development. That's not just a parachurch partnering with the church, but the church being the mechanism by which the community development is done and us not forgetting the proclamation of the gospel and the transformation of souls and the development of the whole person in the process. I'll end it there. Got a lot more, but I, I'm going to end it there. I'm going to stop the screen share and turn it back over to the Perkins. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I won't ask you, we want to ask you some questions, and I want the people here to ask some questions. We, we got to go forth after this pandemic. We got to go forth after this uh, demonizing the church turning the church over in the hands of the political people. So we got to develop the church that is multicultural, 
multi so called races, those people who see God as all in all, and that we have to love one another. That's got to be reflected in the church. We got to remake that. We got a chance to do that. We are looking on past. God is not dead. God is still ruling in the kingdom of men. He wants us to be salt and light in this world. All of us intentionally working together. Intentionally working together. And find those needs anchored in the biblical story. Find those needs that we can create a prototype of the church within our neighborhoods, within our cities, within this. We can't go on fumbling with the mixed multitude. We're going to perish. We're going to perish. We got to become intentional for justice. We got to be intentional in my love for the Hispanic, for the uh, Asian. I get to be special in love to my white people and us black people. We have developed together a significant lie. The one is superior and the other one is inferior. We got to become the church. We got to become what Jesus said to Nicodemus. We got to be born of the Spirit. And that Spirit is Christ living his life out through us. It is Christ in us. I'm committed to that. I've been there. I got committed in my life to that. I, I began that process when I was converted. It was affirmed in the Brandon Jail when I saw that white folk were just as mean as me and I was just as mean as them. And I cried out to a gospel that could burn through this junk, this racial hatred. I'm committed to that. I'm glad very May was committed to it. And we've been able to be committed to this for 64 time years. I'm committed. I'm committed to the incarnation of truth of God. I'm committed to love one another because love is of God. He that loves is born of God. That's what Mason is saying to us, but he's a teacher inside of that junk. He's inside of that foolishness. So we can understand the time in which we are living. And so we can know what to do. I'm ready for questions. Don't give me no long five-minute question. Hit on something that he said to you. A question, not a statement. Yeah, we want to take advantage of this time. I love everybody on here. But some of us are like me. Y'all like to hear yourself talk. And I'm oh, like that. Like to I'm like that. I like to hear myself talk. But I don't, I don't, I don't want to do no stuff here in the morning. Okay. I, I want us to listen for what we can lay our hands on to. Well, Brian Christensen had a, a very good question. Go, go, let him go. All right. Let's do it. Thank you, uh, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Mason. Um, my work, they use the term woke, and I go to a white uh, church in Oregon, which woke is a pejorative. Mm -hmm. So um, can you speak to the difference? Because I think they get mixed up on world wokeness versus church wokeness. Yeah, I think Boy, for that's, me... That's beautiful. That's a beautiful question. Yeah, I think for me... Um, I wrote the book so that unbelievers would want to read it, <clears throat> not so Christians. I think sometimes we we play so to Christian culture that we forget that we need to be missiologists. And <laughs> um, if we keep worrying about like, let's, let's look at this, let's look at several things. So the word logos actually comes from uh, 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 the world. 
like the word logos for Genesis 1 is a worldly term. It's a worldly philosophical term. But that word, he saw a connection between that and said, I can use this as a way, because John is an evangelistic gospel, right? And it's, an, it's apologetic. As a matter of fact, I have a book that I'm going to be going, I don't, I, can't, I don't have it by me right now. I think I do. No, 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 no. I have a book now that's even breaking down the apologetics within uh, the book of John. It's a very... It's a, probably a snooze to most people. I love this kind of stuff. But it's John's apologetics and how he used terminology to missiologically engage his people. Um, the law was made based on Hittite treaties. Uh, Tertullian, uh, the, 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 the African um, church father, uh, developed the word Trinity from, a, from a, mystical, a mysticism word in their culture called Trinitas. And out of that, as he looked at the word Trinitas, he saw that it could be used as a theological, co-opted as a theological term that's culturally engaging, yet, uh, yet, yet, yet can embody a, a, a more redemptive reality of what of the God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And so, one of the things that Christians have just forgot is we forgot how to be missionaries, and we spend our lives trying to please Christians. And so, one of the things that we have to begin doing is if you can't think like a Christian to reach non-Christians. Now, what do I mean by that? You think Christian Lee because you're using the Bible. But one of the things I think evangelicalism has made a huge mistake in is that it, there's, there's, a, there's a imperialism within evangelicalism that you have to please it and that your missiology has to be translatable to them in order for you to be able to do the mission that you're supposed to do to the people that you're supposed to reach. So when I say woke to other black people, they don't think um, LGBTQ and all of, they don't think that. Know, know what the people I showed you, um, know, know what the, um, uh, the people that are in that, in that uh, those, those different groups I showed you, when I say woke to them, they believe that woke points to the fact, um, the, the woke points to the fact that we need to, Christian, black people need to wake up to who they really are. That's what woke means for most of those black groups. Now, what we're saying when we say woke is we're saying waking up to who God has created us to be. But what ends up happening for them, they say it's impossible for Christianity to be woke because they say Christianity is, this is what they believe. They say Christianity in the West is so racist that it's impossible for a, for a black person to call themselves a Christian and have self-worth and value. That's a big statement, but in me, in me, the only reason I think I'm here, we was both leggers and gamblers, and the sheriff came in and wasn't nobody in the house but us children and Grandma Perkins. He said, hey, Perkins, we're going to take you to jail. And she said, are you a fool that I'm going to leave these children here by themselves and go to jail? She said, if I was a man, I would kick your ass. I realized that I had dignity. I don't have no trouble with liking white folks and black folks and liking myself, too. My grandmother told me I had worse. We whites and blacks in America is jacked up with the lie with superiority and inferiority. That's a big old animal. And, and that's gonna be tougher these days when people like uh, LeRon James and all these people are superstars, are just as good as white folks, and white folks are just as good as them. You don't have trouble with that. We have the possibility of this world going to flame. Some people ain't gonna take this no more. You, you can fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time. Lord, we got to know what we're doing. We got to be on our knees, listening for the voice of God. But we can't be too scared to talk about it. This new dictatorship has got everybody afraid of each other. They don't know where it's going. It's the stock market. No, it's the hate. No, it's the virus. 
And which one of these we got to work on? We got to love each other. That's the first thing we got to work on. We got to get to know each other. We got to be reconciled to God and reconciled to each other. That's where I stand. Give me another question. Uh, Chris Fowler had a uh, question about decolonizing the uh, the uh, the church. The church. Chris, you want to speak to that? Sure, yeah, yes. question. So decolonizing yeah, the church. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, what, what's your question, um, Chris? Yeah, Ellen, it's just this whole thing of the Western church, the American church, I'm from Canada, the Canadian church is the same thing, is so full of like Western European superiority, white culture. How can we get rid of that bathwater and and actually begin to celebrate and embrace each other and, and, and prophetically uh, display something different? Uh, that's that a great has... question. That's a great question. Um, that's a good one. Go ahead. Great question. I think it's easy. It's already happening. The church isn't growing in America like it is in South America and Africa and Asia. <laughs> so the global church, the global church, the Western church is the minority in the world. Now, it's not minority yet in its influences, whether it's writing commentaries, theological education, different things like that. But the way decolonization is going to happen is for other ethnicities uh, to uh, to not just come into to integrate white institutions because you still have the culture there in the midst of that integration, and so um, and so what's going to have to happen is um, there's going to have to be African Americans and uh, Chinese and Koreans and Africans and Latinos that start. Theological education, one of my spiritual sons, uh, Doug Logan, has just started Grimke Seminary. And it's a multi-ethnic seminary that just started and it has 100 students in its first cohort. So when you, 80, 80 students in its first cohort. And so when you start, th there has to be, um, from the theological education perspective um, and from the ecclesiological perspective of conversions, Conversions is going to help change that. When you have people of other ethnicities that grow up in the faith and they're being discipled and they become missionaries and they have to contextualize the gospel to their particular folk, to their particular culture, you're automatically going to have the decolonization uh, that happens. I don't think the decolonization of the Western world is going to, uh, Western church is going to happen. I think the Western church is going to decline because the, 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 the generations that have been funding the denominations for the last hundred years, they're starting to die. And once you have the defunding of those, because th these younger people, they got too many student loans to, 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 to be a part of creating an endowment. <laughs> so, so, so as, so as, so as that, as, 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 as those endowments begin to decrease, those denominations are, in, are either going to hold on for dear life or make the necessary changes to submit to the reality of the way God is shifting things. Great question. Could I just follow that up with one other quick question? Because I totally agree with you. I'm I'm not a guy that's going to be going to seminary or, or necessary. Like I see that macro stuff going on. I'm trying to dumb it down even for myself to th this micro conversation of like, I just have this tendency to hang out with people who look like, think like, talk like me, who come from my culture. And we're just comfortable in our own culture. And how, how can we like overcome those barriers and actually show something different to the world that that we're not scared by each other's way of doing church or way of worshiping or way of interacting with each other and stuff? Is, is there a way that are there some practical things that we could do to actually start yeah. changing that? Yeah, one of the things that I would say is um, it's two things. Um, I had a friend in Nebraska ask me, "How do I?" build more relationships with uh, black people. I said, doc, you in Nebraska. I said, ain't no black people where you are, is it? He said, no. I said, well, you can, you can ease your conscience. I said, but what you should do is think more systemically about ra racism instead of relational. I think, I think a lot of times, I, I, think it's, I think it's important that we build relationships across ethnic lines. I think that's important. But, but we have to attack racism from a system perspective. And 
And so what says, you got to ask yourself the question, where do you see racism, Chris? And where in your sphere of influence of systems that God can use your white voice as a Christian voice to engage the issues that can bring systemic change where you live and dwell. And I think that will create more black relationships for you, whether they're in your context or not, because when African-Americans see whites who use, and I'll use the word, I, don't, I hope y'all don't get mad, but use their privilege for godly ends, that automatically gives you common ground with black people. Um, because that's, 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 um, that that's that's just a beautiful thing, and it's just like uh, uh, it's just like um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 Jim Elliot's rule. Jim Jim Elliot. Uh, Jim Elliot's rule said, "He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose." I love yeah. that quote. And, and so and so, I think that when you say uh, that I'm willing to lose my life for Christ's sake in, a, in order to gain it, the identity that the world has affirmed in me, I want to use that identity to affirm the identity of others. Explosive. This is, this is glorious. This is glorious. Let's keep um, going here. I, I have a question. Um, Ken, uh, with, with trying to um, integrate churches, um, how does um, assimilation take place both ways instead of it um in, in the past being a, a one-way type of assimilation that um blacks are trying to be uh uh more you know you try you're trying to be more like the dominant culture but that that, that let me say that let me add, come in yeah. here that's the story of one blood that's taking the incarnation deepest thought he came to save us from our sin. It is one blood doing that. I think that's the initiative there. You got to start with the truth. I mean, practically, or practical uh, things like, uh, I, do, do they, do they? I, I think the practical things that I hear you, the practical thing you got to do is read it. Educate the, yourself. That's what you got to read it. You got to read a truth. John Bunyan started with a truth that Christianity is a is a is a journey towards the light. Rick Warren said that God had a purpose for your life. That purpose is for good and not for evil. Those are the big books. One blood is a big incarnation of book. So, and, and, and Awake a wait, is a big book. It's a big book. It's a book. It was written by a third grader. I got some good people to write with me, to work with me. So, so I think what he's saying here, that we got to think about these things and act upon them to see whether or not they are working. And then we got to be listening to God. We got to be listening to God for truth. We got to get beyond my truth, your truth. But God's still there. He's the majority. He's the third person. He's the third person. So we got to listen carefully to God. I, I and, know and, here in Mississippi that um, people, you know, uh, white people have a difficult time emerging themselves into black culture. Well, blacks have a difficult time. Right. Well, uh, black folks don't want many white people in their church. Yeah. It is not their style, yeah. that Christian style, to think beyond the old culture. It's not uh, their style. Uh, can, I, can I say something to that? Go ahead, buddy. You, you know, don't want to... <laughs> I, I want to say something to that because I want to add to what you're saying, if okay. I can, if that can even be done. But... um. African Americans who are a part of predominantly white churches, right? So, I, so I get questions like this. I have a black person ask me, "How do I get my church to start focusing on race issues?" I said, "What you mean by that?" Well, these things happened in my past. It hasn't said anything. Um, and I said, "How many? What 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 kind of context is it in? Predominantly white." Then I asked them, "How many?" African-Americans or minorities is at the church. 
Um, there are only uh, about 20 of us. How many people are at the church? 400. So I said, you want them to turn the missiological ship of their church towards the issues of a small group of you guys. I said, now, you need to lovingly engage the pastor, but you need to not expect that church to make necessarily on their missiological journey racial injustice contextually their major thrust, right? But then on the other hand, you know, whites, white, my white brothers and sisters tend to think because if they have 400 people, they have 20 black people and 10 Asian people and 15 Latino people that they're multi-ethnic church. There's not enough of a cultural balance in that church for it to be multi-ethnic. So you gotta stop lying to yourself and say, we basically have a white church. And, and then on the other hand, multi-ethnic churches, a lot of times blacks lose in multi-ethnic churches because the church doesn't view black issues as something that needs to be systemically engaged because everybody's trying to give everybody equal standing in missiological engagement, which most of those contexts African-Americans are gonna be frustrated at. I think the most effective churches going forward that are gonna be multi-ethnic have to be led by minorities. The only way it's gonna work is when those who have had, had the main seat give up the main seat in order that I saw it done by my friend Brian De Ritz and them in Memphis when they did their thing at Fellowship Memphis. Uh, they gave the church was 10% African American in the most racist city in America, 10% African American, 90% white. Um, John Bryson said, Man, with me being senior pastor of the church, this church is forever going to be white. They switched, Brian took over, and it wasn't a tokenism. If anybody knows Brian De Ritz, He's a he's a, a great leader. So it wasn't tokenism because tokenism does just as much damage as racism. When you put a token in place who doesn't have the acumen for that role when they fail, people view that as an ethnic failure versus a competency failure. Please help me today, somebody. And, 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 so, and, 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 and so and so what has to happen is you have to have competent black men and women leading stuff so that they can lead the missiological charge and our white brothers and sisters come alongside of it in the way that blacks have come alongside of them. This this promotes this promotes missiological authenticity, contextual clarity, because you have to have character, competency, commitment, compatibility, and connection. Yep. Okay, let's take one more. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let's take one more. Let's take one more. Go ahead. So, thank you for taking my question. Uh, given the writings of Brian Stevenson, Willie James Jennings, Michelle Alexander, and Elza Isabel Wilkerson, and so many others that are bringing um, this history to the white church, that uh, history we can understand. What do your view? What is your view on reparations? Should the traditional white churches and seminaries, like the one you attended, take the lead to make reparations to people of color whom they've sinned against in thought, word, and action? Yeah. So I did a sermon. Check out um, Go to Epiphany podcast. I did a um, a series just recently where I talked about those things, and I did a ser sermon on reparations. Um, of course um uh people <laughs> people blew me up about it so i do believe in reparations and i gave a practical solution for I, I gave practical uh starting steps as well so i gave theology of reparations but then gave practical steps as well um so um there are groups that are think that are working through it i think the problem this is the problem we have to start getting with those we have to stop doing apologetics with people we disagree with and what i mean i'm talking about apologetics with christians who are just going to vehemently fight us and we have to get with those um uh, it's on epiphany fellowship podcast somebody said what was the sermon on reparations go to epiphany fellowship on the podcast app and you'll see reparations and it's on youtube as well and it's on our facebook page and so yes i believe in reparations one of the things that i said and people blew me up about it i said african americans for the next 200 years <laughs> needs to have free 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 uh education uh, for the next 200 years i said that's 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 one of the things and you know i, I said 
uh, I, I gave what did I what I gave as practical ways to make reparation better because one of the things that people don't understand is we when when black people got out of slavery we were raped we had our identity destroyed all these different things we were beaten castrated we got out of we got out of slavery with no economic plan no counseling if someone were to get raped today we would try to bring everything around them we could to make sure they had support can you imagine families broken families who have been spread all over the place with no economics trying to find their children trying to find their spouse after being pushed off a plantation with no place to live and no money or anything but then the slave masters get reparation it is the most atrocious that's it is the most atrocious thing that, that has ever happened in history. And so now we have the generational trauma of post-slavery aesthetic that's impacting us today. So what we have to do is we have to pick some key things. We have to pick some key things that are not, like Dr. Perkins would say, poverty-based ministries. We don't need, we don't need to say, give us food for a hundred years. We don't need, no, don't give me food. Listen, <laughs> I want you to help empower our generations to catch up in the marathon that white people have gotten a head start on of for the last 400 years. <laughs> and so let's do that. Let's do that in ways that are redemptive though, and that are helpful because in my community, there are African-Americans. If you just gave them money, they wouldn't know what to do with it. Just like in any culture, you don't just say, Hey, let's give every person a, a half a million dollars that look at the lotto. When people win the lottery, they're broke five months later. So if, if, if you don't teach people how to handle business, how to handle money, how to handle funding, uh, and, and, and how to go forward, well, there has to be things like promoting, and I'm going to say this and I'm going to shut up. Look at Black Wall Street. We need that again. We need places like Black Wall Street where there is a community where there is development and formation and development where Blacks can have the dollar stay in their community just as long as the Chinese, our Chinese siblings, Chinese, our Chinese uh, friends, that the dollar stays in their community for 29 days. Uh, the, 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 the black dollar stays in the community less than 48 hours. So we have to we have to work on things like that for reparations. So anyway, I could go on and on about this. Y'all pray for me. <laughs> what do you mean by systemic outreach? Uh, 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 so that's a great question. So systemic outreach, one of the things that I, 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 I think that we have to be careful of is just having a food pantry and having a clothing ministry we need we need um we need educational ministries that are teaching skills we need yeah. schools that help give a comprehensive view of history we need to teach uh we need to uh have uh, uh ministries that help with housing but you can't help a person get a house if they don't have good economic constructs that helps them to keep the house. So you have to you have to develop it, but you can't even just do, say, we're gonna help start businesses in the community when people don't know how to have a job. How are you gonna expect somebody to start a business when they don't know how to come to work on time? So what I'm saying is you have to, poverty, poverty uh, perpetuating ministries are ministries that doesn't help with things like financial literacy, um, that doesn't help with the basic things that the Bible, Jesus talks about money a third of the time. The Bible talks about, and so how do we begin to help the, this is what Dr. Perkins has been saying for 60 years. We have to disciple the whole person. That's, that's what we're talking about. If we don't disciple the whole person, when you leave any part of any person undiscipled, there's going to be gaps and there's going to be spiritual and practical poverty in that area of their life, whether they're wealthy or whether they're poor. Amen. Is that, that, is that, is that why 40? Because then a mule, you know, uh, the land is back in the hands of the, uh, of, of the dominant culture. Yeah, because you can give somebody land, but if they don't know how to farm, what you give it to them for? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah give another a, question. Uh, two questions, okay? One, Doug Gentile had a question, and then Randy Neighbor had the last, let, let, last question. Yeah. Go ahead. Who first? Uh, Doug. Doug Gentile, are you there? If if not, then uh, Randy neighbor neighbors um, of uh, of it's Chattanooga, right? Yeah, yeah, that's hey, my guy. Randy, are you still there? I'm still here. Okay, uh, you had a question. Yeah, two questions yeah. actually. Yeah. Thank you, D 
Dr. Mason, thank you. On behalf of all of us, thank you so much for your brilliance and uh, your commitment to the city. My first question is personal, the second, and, but maybe we should do that last. But the other question I had had to do about getting pastors to get out into the streets and caring about the community. But the, the, that other question had to do with your wife. How is her health? We know that she struggled and we hope yeah. she's well. Yeah, my wife is doing well. She had, um, she got a liver transplant 16 years ago, got her second one two years ago, um, and had eight, uh, five, six bouts with cancer. But she's doing really, really well now. Only thing is she just has reactions to meds. But other than that, uh, she's doing really, really well, thriving. Thank you. Um, thank you for asking, sir. And, so the um, other and he you got another question. Okay. Yeah. The other part of that had to do with radicalizing pastors so they get out into the community. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I think it's um, we don't see uh, we don't see gospel mission as an emergency anymore. Um, and it's because our people aren't well discipled enough. Our people are cowards. One of the things I challenge this generation with, as I said, y'all love friendships more than y'all love truth. This generation, I've challenged them. Y'all got more friends and buddies. Yeah, they Listen, this generation has more lost friends than the past generations put together. But because they like being liked so much, I've had to challenge them. I said, you have, you have, LG, you have gay friends, lesbian friends, uh, 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 drug addict friends, rich friends that are wilding out. And you just want you and you just want to post a selfie, but you never tell them about Jesus. And I said, you have to get beyond wanting to be like and being viewed as the non-judgmental Christian. <laughs> and, and, and be able to say, you can share the gospel in a non-judgmental way. You already got credibility because you're in a relationship. So that happens when the leaders start modeling gospel missiology. And then challenging the church to stop letting, we treat the, the pulpit like priests. We pay you to do everything. And then we'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll just give and come to church. It has to be more than that. It has to be more than that. And so that's been our big challenge with this whole thing is getting leaders uh, 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 to, uh, you know, you use the word radical. I just say, you know, it's, it's bad that we have to use an uh, 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 extra adjective to describe what Christianity is already supposed to be. <laughs> Christianity is just, it's, it's, it's radical anyway, but it's bad that we become so lukewarm that we have to add radical to it to redefine ourselves of what we're supposed to actually be. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's, let's keep going here. This is a good time. We never, y'all are obeying with the question. Yeah. You're asking the creative question and you are listening. So I'm thankful that you are teaching at the John Perkins Bible study. Hey, hey, you know, hey, this hey, is a good up. morning. So, so, I'm willing to give our after show time to this right here. So, oh, I'm okay. Okay. Well, uh, but uh, uh, I had I had one, a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions. I uh, uh, I had one one question. Um, in your teaching, you talked about the uh, black Jews and the uh, different people like uh, Ilana Vanzant. Um, what? How are they the problem in the black community? Explain that more. That's a big one. That's a great question. Well, they are. Listen. They are the they are the uncash receipts of the church's unwillingness to engage black dignity. Well, what? Say it again. <laughs> to me now. Uh, say that again and uh, let they, me they are the they are the uncashed receipts of the church not being willing to restore black dignity. Mm -hmm. Whenever the church doesn't do what it's supposed to do, Satan knows it and he molests it. 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. We moved to did, did you hear that? Did y'all hear that? I want you to hear what I just said. Say whenever it again. The, Say it again. Whenever right. the church, whenever the church does not do what it's supposed to do, and Satan knows it, he molests it. So what he did was he said, oh, they, they're they going to reject Black dignity. Guess what we're going to do? Guess what we're going to do? He, he gathered his demonic heavenly host together, and, and the Bible says, in later times, many will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And so the devil, God has doctrine and the devil has doctrine. What he did was he came in the black community and created an alternative dignity doctrine that did the same thing that white supremacy did by making blacks think their identity was in their blackness and restoring their blackness according to the flesh, not according to the one who created their blackness. Right. That's right. That's right. Wow. That's right. Okay, let's go. Let's keep going here. Our resident philosopher Ron Spann, if you're still on, um, what is your question? Because we know you got one. <laughs> yeah, Ron has a question. Ron, Ron has a question. Uh, I hear. Here's my wife. I'm terms. sorry. This is my wife. Just want to say hi. Oh, beautiful. Wow. Welcome. I don't my question. Let me let me turn it on, JP. You see her now. He got he got such a wonderful woman. Yeah. Uh, He's a guy. Brother who... Eric. Um, uh, since I haven't read Woke Church, I don't know uh, what you think about uh, the challenge that we've been getting from Reverend Mark Charles on the doctrine of discovery uh, and how that has bolstered Western supremacy teachings in the church and in the culture. Uh, I'm afraid that we get locked into a black-white polarity and we see everything's in black and white, but our native brothers and sisters through his voice have really put something out there. And I'm curious what you think about what he's challenging us with around uh, this doctrine of discovery. Now explain to me what the doctrine of discovery is so I can understand it. Okay, oh, that's a, that's a very important piece of, I, we can't get it on, but basically it's the teaching first in the Catholic church in the 15th century from, from the Pope who put a papal bull that said, uh, going forward, uh, if uh, if white Europeans discovered in a, went to any other part of the globe as they were beginning to discover it by then, you know, starting mm -hmm. to explore and Christopher yeah. Columbus and all that, and the people weren't white and weren't Christian, uh, the explorers had every right either to kill the people or to enslave them. And, and then to convert them and do it, but do with the land. They were entitled to take the land for free. Okay. Uh, even though the Puritans and the people who came from English speaking Britain in the 17th century, like the pilgrims in New England and so on, they weren't Catholics, but they used the same doctrine of discovery, uh, trying to model themselves on the stories of the Hebrews in the Old Testament. Okay. and declare America the special place for them to come and kill the natives and to- So, you know, so make a long story short, they're trying to reinforce the doctrine of discovery? Well, as it's, a way not, to, it's, not there, it's not trying to re, it has become the law of the land, discovery. Has yeah, the now. problem there, that, that's, that's a good question. So I think I understand what you're saying. So um, you, we know that the pill, I have a book over here. Um, let me get it, hold on one second. Um, I have a book over here that, um, in this book, in this book here, the Puritans, the Puritans, this shows where the Puritans, it's called Puritan Race Virtue, Vice Values, 1620 to 1820, Original Calvinist True Believers, Enduring Faith and Exodus and uh, uh, Ethics and Race Claims. What, what that book talks about is the fact that Puritans were the chaplains on slave ships and they actually helped develop and promote the curse of Ham so that slave owners would have a framework for using, uh, so that it was spread basically the, the daily destruction of black people. That's how deep, we don't even know, we, we, we you know, the pilgrims and 
the Puritans did that. And so the doctrine of discovery is a false doctrine that has been promoted for centuries, basically that made the church Israel in a way, in, in this way. Now, you know, and I understand covenant theology, dispensationalism, all of that, neo-covenant theology, progressive dispensation. I, I studied all that, know all of that, right? But there's a way in which they've turned covenant theology into nationalism. And in turning covenant theology into nationalism, they that's this is nothing but the same doctrines that the Crusaders use in order to be an imperialistic uh, entity, right? And so what has happened is, is that same doctrine of discovery is the same philosophy around why people, when you when you challenge the status quo of, of Western white culture, they push back. Uh, be, uh, and that's why Confederate philosophy is where you have people like, um, and I'm going to name them, Doug Wilson, who's a who's a neo who's a he calls himself a neo Confederate. He said relationships between blacks and whites were at their best when we were in slaves and slaves and and, 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 and that, that was the relationship and so that whole idea of doctrine of discovery is just another way to try to theologize cultural imperialism which is nothing but a doctrine of demons that's just simply columbus discovered america y'all <laughs> that's the same thing right right white is white right. so he if, if, hey, if i come to your house if america. i come to your if I come to your house, if I come to the Perkins house in Mississippi, and I say I discovered it, and you're going to y'all live there. How did I discover it? <laughs> I'm going to get you out of here. <laughs> Extract that right on. Up yeah, this is so. This, look, look, this is so beautiful, and I'm trying. Uh, uh, Mason has been so creative, but my friend, our Bible class has been so creative in, 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 in creating this environment where we can really listen to each other. It's pointing the way. This is beautiful. And we're doing it at this crucial time when the, we're at this crisis time. In the next few weeks. One week. Next few months. Oh. We got to start talking about okay. <laughs> a workable reality, a workable reality based upon the incarnation of thought. Well, Knowing the will of God and doing the will of God in our day. So this is... It's been great. This is what our Bible class is about. I, I hope we can keep on doing this as long as Vera May and I can can do this and together. And we'll continue it on even. And I think that... Because you'll be back with us too, right? He, uh, he's a forever friend. Eric is a forever friend. He's our family absolutely, friend. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, oh, yeah. And and we'll, we'll, we'll have... I'll have a Mark Charles on. We sort of discovered him in CCDA. Yeah. And we sort of nurtured him on our board of directors. Yes. And we had to calm him down and 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 make him think his way out of it. And boy, he got his and he's thinking his way out of it. And so these are our people. Yes. I'm so grateful. And thank you so much uh for, for taking this time to just um educate us and teach us um uh from the word of God and we're just so grateful for you. Um, some, some Let's have a say, cup of prayer okay. since she gave us the time. Well, I'm going I'm to get to the prayer right, okay. after, right after I um, announce my commercial. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, somebody on the chat said, well, how much, how much do we charge for this? Uh, uh, for, for these lessons that we're given? You know, the one thing that we um, don't do is that we, we don't charge for this Bible study. Um, the Perkins Foundation exists to inspire and equip Christians to bring about biblical restoration in communities of need and biblical reconciliation between Christians separated by a multitude of differences. So we rely on friends like you to, um, to undergird us and to help us help keep our, keep, um, our ministry going forward. So we would just um, ask that you 
Um, if you would support us, we need your support each and every day. It keeps our um, lights on. It keeps us able to just go on every day and to minister to the children, families in this neighborhood and around the United States. So um, you can go to our, our secure website at JVMPF, that's John Vera May Perkins Foundation dot org slash donate. And if you become a recurring um, uh, friend, then well, recurring. Uh, we call them friends, not donors. Um, then we can get. We'll give you. You'll get a, a gift of a a a, um, a mask to wear for John Perkins mask. So uh, we're just so thankful for you and, and ask that you would just um, help us out each and each um, each month. So um, we are. Our next week's guest will be uh, our very own Matt McGill. And uh, he'll be on on, on the date uh, on the the date that we are um, voting. So may have to sit some. Well, he's council. This is intentional. Huh? He is the developer of the one church uh, okay. concept movement. He spent five years here with us in Jackson and developed a model of that. He's back in Atlanta, heading up a church that is planting churches that see themselves as one right. in their neighborhood and the community. Of course, they do their work. They look at the community and see what it looks like and see what they can do about that. So he'll be talking. I'm looking on past this election. I'm looking on past uh, uh, virus 19. Mm -hmm. We still got to be here. Yeah. And we, we got to still be preaching the gospel, in season, out of season, mm -hmm. uh, speaking up, speaking up. And someone someone mentioned, um, Eric, what is the uh, name of the church in L.A. that uh, that you all planted? Is it Fellowship Epiphany, Monrovia? Epiphany, uh, Epiphany L.A. <clears throat> okay. Monrovia, right. that's, that's like an hour away from L.A., but uh, our ch the church... Tiffany LA uh, meets in the YMCA in South Central LA. Okay, all right. Then yeah. someone will ask that question. So we're gonna take take a little time and um and just pray right hey, now. Stella, pray. Stella, Stella, it's one it's one more good question that I see on this um this chat here, and it's from Maru. Um, and, and it's it, from I, Maru. I'll, I'll just okay. read it. I'm I'm just gonna read it. What is the best oh. advice for black Christians who are hurt and tired from their experience in white multicultural church? Uh, Eric. Eric. Um, yeah. Um, you know, who, who are who are hurt, I think there needs you you need to have a time of detox um from those environments because I know that there is a real hurt from those environments, a real brokenness from those environments. And you have to put yourself in a situation where you're not re-traumatized again. Um, I, I wouldn't give up on church, but I would go to it. I would talk to the leadership and say, hey, um, I don't hate you all. I love you all. These are some, I think, going through the process of biblical reconciliation of just saying what you, unless you've already gone through that. If you're past that, I would say transition out lovingly and put yourself in a situation where, and I wouldn't say become churchless and just be online only, even after the pandemic is over, but um, to be able to get in a situation where you, you're around a healthy theological environment and also uh, an environment where the issues that you need spoken to that were missing in that environment are spoken to. I've, I've, I've heard so many people deal with that and that's really a huge remedy that God can use to really help heal you. Right, because not everybody can can take what you can take, JP. You know, well, I, I, un I understand. Yeah. I understand mm -hmm. creating an environment of love mm -hmm. and creating an environment of the oneness of the human race. Right. So I understand all of that. I and mean, we got to find principles. To end. I wrote a book on culture captivity, oh, yeah. a chapter. Yeah. Uh, and how we are captive to our culture. That determines our behavior mm -hmm. you, you know, in life. So we, we're discussing these things. 
and, and the fact that we have an environment here of, of, of people who want to discuss them, and we don't want to demonize those people who are on the way. We don't want to be, demonize our conservative Republicans. We don't want to demonize our liberal Democrats and, and our black Democrats and all of that. We got to approach that with, with love and sanity. And I don't want no enemies. I don't want no enemies. I don't want to have to love them. I, I don't want them to be. I want to try to approach them in a way that I affirm their dignity to start with and let our unity remain. Our unity remain. You know, so that's what I, I that's what I have committed my life to. And I can't back up. I can't back up. I'm too committed to seeing my Savior face to face. I'm going with what he has taught me. And I'm going with the people well, we, that have held me for the last 60 years. These are my friends. Amen. These are my friends. And so we need to pass some sense of of life and hope right. to this we got to dig out of. That God is a scientist. He's God. Mm -hmm. We got to listen to him. Yeah. The God who caused the light to shine out of darkness, that's the God who shined that light into our heart to give us the knowledge of the glory of God and the scientific know-how to approach this in life. So I'm just so grateful that I had this chance. I'm, I'm grateful that we have friends and I'm, that we love each other. And that's deeper than race, ethnicity, and all of that is because we want to know God and we want to know each other. <laughs> that's what it means to be a Christian, is to know him and to make him known and to serve him, work for him, to worship him forever. That's the fullness. We don't disagree on that. We agree that this is what it means to be a Christian. Uh, this is what it means to be a Christian. And then uh, walk in that love and then see, 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 see what Jesus can do it. If you abide in me and my word abide in you, you can ask for continuation. You can ask each other to uh, join with us mm -hmm. in making the reality in this kind of conversation. This is big. This is big, even in our whole concept of Zooming, that we can create a relationship where we can get to know each other and interact with each other and love each other and keep that as our priority. Y'all, this is, hey, let's pray. Daddy, Daddy um, a, a lot of people on the chat are, are, are wanting a part two, uh, Mr. Eric, I mean, Pastor Eric. Uh, so hopefully, down the road, we can get a part two to this uh, uh, fantastic morning we've had. And possibly and you and your wife come to Jackson for one yeah. of our pilgrims. Let, let, let's Amen. pray for let's pray for Mama. All right. Well, well let's um, take a time to pray. And um, is uh, is Brother Vander Ark? Are you still on? If he's not on, yeah, Vander Ark. I see him. I'm here. Would you close us and uh, give us give us a closing blessing? Uh, we know you you passed and, and it say in anything you want to say for half a minute. Let's pray together. Eternal God, you have created us all. And you have given us our marching orders. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. And yet, in so many ways, we have failed. So we come before you 
asking for forgiveness, mm. asking you to fill our hearts with love. Oh God, be merciful, be gracious, and help each one of us to live as you would have us live. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. We close it out today. We're closing out, and thank you so much for, for joining us, and we will see you all next week. Um, and uh, anybody who wants to stay out after this um, for about 10 more minutes, we, we have that. But uh, Pastor Eric and John Perkins, you all can sign off, and we thank you so much. And you can go get yourself a cup of um, Ethiopian Sadama. All righty. Take care. Thanks a bunch. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Um, we are uh, here, and um, you know, that was such a um, engaging and um, conversation that we had. And um, and I was just like, wow, we, we have to have him back. We have to have Eric back again because um, uh, we're not finished learning, finished, um, educating ourselves. We're, we're, we're disciples. And, uh, and so we're just, we, we, we need that. So what I want to ask was, um, what do you see as um, ways that you can, practical ways that you can, um, can convey this message in your life? Um, to to friends, to people that you meet, um, different ways of, about how how we can do that. I know for me, one of the things that he said that I felt was so easy, but uh, was to was the social media part. We have so many friends on social media. We are um, always posting, but we're never sharing who we really are in Christ. And so I felt like that was a good way for us to um, begin sharing the gospel um, to people who uh, are non-believers and people who are believers. So I felt like that was that was um, that was brilliant. My mind yeah. is blown, y'all. I'm just gonna tell y'all right now. My mind is blown. Yeah. Um, and uh, and is anyone having um, in any? What are some of the biggest issues that you see that we're facing um, in our in, in your and personally, you know, as we move toward trying to live a reconciled life? Is there is, are there things that are hindering your way? Does anybody have any thought on that, Doug? I know you had a question, Doug Gentile. Just unmute yourself. You're muted. Um, I had a thought. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Okay. Um, Doug, you can go at, um, I was asking Doug, you, you had something to share? Oh, he's, um, he must have his volume down. No, here. Can you all hear me? Oh, I see. Doug? Say, we can't hear no. you, Doug. I, I think someone else said she had something to share and Doug can share after her. Okay. Who okay. Is Thank you, Tammy. So, no, Maru. Hi, everybody. So I was really encouraged when um, Pastor Mason said, you know, even what you just brought up about our, our being comfortable with being liked and not wanting to challenge in those settings. And I think sometimes we can get so fixated on what other people, how other people aren't using their privilege or how other people are not um, doing what they're supposed to do. But the Lord works in our faithfulness and in our obedience. So... Um, I just feel like, you know, there's a lot of frustration with, you can look at, you know, white led churches or whatnot, but you're expecting people to completely change their whole paradigm and the paradigm of their, the people who discipled them and their founding fathers and things like that. But what about us in terms of being willing to break some chains in our own life of, you know, letting go of that idol of, I want to be the non-judgmental Christian, even though, you know, people know who you stand for Christ, but do we speak as much about Christ 
um, in the context, especially of woke spaces, where a lot of times that's less, uh, that's harder to do is to push the holiness of Christ in woke spaces. So I really felt like that was a powerful takeaway for me that I would be meditating on and acting on. Amen. That's wonderful. And what's your, what's your name? Oh, I'm Maru. I've met both of you ladies. Um, I go to Greenhouse. So the, the question was not just Amen. a personal question that you that. asked. You know, I just know a lot of people who have bowed out of church settings for, for some of these issues. And I feel like, you know, it's important, even if you find flaws in your church, which you'll find in every church, to stay connected to the body of Christ. Right. Right. Did you come to Jackson? I have not been to Jackson, but I have I have been shared the stage with Dr. Perkins. I have had the honor of doing that with him in Gainesville. And I've picked him up from the airport and brought him back to the airport. And I've met both yeah. of you a few times. Okay. All righty. All right. That's what we tell you. Is she the lawyer? Is she the lawyer? Uh, Are you the law? Is she the lawyer? Are you the lawyer? I am. Okay, yeah. Hey, girl. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Perkins. I didn't know you were hey, still there. He came back down when he heard you talking. <laughs> we had a winner here, and naturally, I asked about you and everything. And I'm satisfied with what you're doing. Amen. I'm praying for you. Thank you. That means so much. We, we were. We had Wendy here, and uh, we spoiled her, so you have to come and get spoiled, too. Oh, I can't I wait. <laughs> and we don't even take visitors. She just dropped in on us. I mean, that was just something. She, just, she, she was brave enough to just say, hey, I'm coming. I don't oh. care what you guys say. I'm so, going to have to text okay. Wendy. I, I was yeah. just talking to her yesterday. I'm going to text her. She got to take me on that next drop-in. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, Haitian princess. Yes. He calls her Haitian princess. Asian princess. So, love y'all. Hi, Hi, I didn't know you were here. I'm here. Hi, everyone. Wendy, where you at? Let me uh, change my interview. But anyways, um, wow, Wendy. Um, uh, thank you for coming down, Wendy. You're just such a, a wonderful friend. And um, who is this? Um, the plume. The plum. Well, so let me tell you. Uh, Good morning. Who, 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 where is she? Where is she? Oh, no, it was Tia Plum. Did you have a question, Tia? Or comment? No. You have. Oh, okay. I, I want to hear oh, uh, uh, Curdy. Curdy, I want to hear what you have to think about today. Oh, man. I'm, I'm thoroughly encouraged being a, a Philly boy myself. Yeah. And here speak it was like fire to my soul especially uh, my wife and I moved here to the Midwest four years ago and so the work that we did in Philadelphia we're trying to establish um, here in Kansas City and um, yeah I, I think it was just rich I, I love the, the way that he contextualizes everything that is saturated with scripture um, and what I love most about uh, Dr. Mason much like you know, JP is that neither one of them are, um, they're, they're not therapists. They don't theorize, right? They are uh, practitioners in their own way. Um, that, you know, my, my grandfather actually leave, lives about uh, two blocks from where Epiphany is established, where um, Mason is the pastor. And to see the way that they've loved the city, um, is is really rich um and it's impacted my heart as well as you know uh the community that's there and even the city officials um so I, I love the fact that when i hear people sometimes people can theorize about stuff that they're not actually having a hand to the plow to mm -hmm. right and um he's actually paid the cost um even on big platforms that have actually pushed him off because of some of those stances that he's made so i'm i'm appreciative and then um I think he's he's answered the question that I've been asking on this line because, like I told you, I'm a, I'm an '80s kid, born in '82, and so when I look on this line, some of us are a little bit further than that, right? Yep. <laughs> so uh, the generational gap. How do you reach generation? And so the fact that he spoke to that and he asked us the question, "Who 
is pastoring this generation. Um, I felt convicted myself as to how do I, how do I lead the young people, um, the millennials and then the Gen Zs that are right here in front of me. So it was a rich time. Yeah, that, that is that is going to be um, a. Uh, I, it's almost as if I can foresee it being um, an issue as we move forward because young people are getting almost all of their information uh, from the internet and from um, from uh, you know sites that are um, that, that that aren't Christ centered. So uh, we're gonna have a. a, a we're going to have something on our hands. And a lot of times we don't think through the different things that we, we, you know, invent and think that they are um, good for society or, you know, or, or like say for instance, welfare programs that you think are, are going to be good. You don't think down the line, how it will affect individuals, um, how things like the kids in the cages are going to affect them forever. And, and what that's going to do, what that will do to American culture and, um, and not just to their lives, which is, which, um, is calling, causing irreparable harm, but how um, it will affect um, our, our culture at large. So we, we really have to uh, think through things and, and get, my, like my dad says, have um, people around you who are giving good, sound advice. Because um, the the dumbest person in the room is the person that says that they know everything, and um and, and says they're the smartest one in the room, and that they know everything that they're the best that could ever be. So, y'all know what I'm talking about. So, um, uh, Mary, could you share with us? Um, uh, we have about uh two two minutes. Okay, thank you for y'all. Have a word. We were so blessed to hear the message he covered so much. He really evoked all of us. Now I want to comment one thing that I don't know if everybody paid attention to what he said. So racism does not only result in the church, it's also in the community. It like Marv said, it starts the change starts within each of us. We cannot change anybody else, but we can change our lives when we surrender to God. God is the one that gives us knowledge and wisdom to go out into the community to take care of those people. And also in the church community also, you make a difference by your own life, by surrendering to Christ. You have to follow, take up the cross, deny the self and follow him. That's where real change comes, we as believers. And I want to say something about Curtis Wright because my heart is also just like his heart is I've been praying for generations. God's word has to go forth from generations to generations. I have children of Curtis age. So I'm glad to say my son serves the Lord with all his heart and soul. He is in the Air Force, so he can't be here on this meeting. But on the other hand, I have a daughter who strayed away from the Lord, knowing the Lord, but my hope is in God. So I will not fear that God has gone, left 99 and went forth to work for one, and he will go forth for, forth for her to bring her back. But if anybody has their children straight away, your hope must be in God. You must pray and pray. But again, I want to go back to this. We must change. We must be like Jesus. Then only, then only we can bring change in the church. Okay, don't go right. to the pastors. Look for yourself to bring a change in others, even in the past. You. you change. Thank you so much, uh, and, and and we need to be praying for our families, and uh, because all of us have, you know, someone in our family who is not um, is, is not uh, uh, seeking Christ, but we're raised in a in a church um, and raised with the gospel. And, um, and God has promised that he will bring those children back to himself. So um, we will pray for them and, and I'll continue to just encourage them in any way because we can't change hearts. That's, that's the job of the Holy Spirit. So Close thank up. you so much. No, I'm, I'm, I want to say I'm, one, okay. one quick thing. Uh, Curtis and Wendy and uh, Stone, uh, y'all young people, we're going to need y'all to begin to invite young people to, to uh, this this uh bible study amen and wendy if you're there would you give a uh, close us in a word of prayer yes you got it 
Father, thank you so much for just this rich time this morning. Thank you for equipping Dr. Mason. Thank you for Dr. Perkins and just the legacy that you have given us through them. We just ask that you would give us the boldness and the grace um, and the strength to um, act, uh, act out just like the Great Commission and everything that you have called us to, Lord. Let us not sit by idly and just take these words in, but Lord, we really do want to be ambassadors for you and um, see the gospel lived out in and, and its fullness, Lord. So we ask like Holy Spirit that you would come and equip us and that you would give us eyes to um, see this world through your eyes, Father, and that we would go um, and just do justice, um, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, Lord. So uh, yeah, throughout the day, throughout our lives, um, allow us to do this and to this, do this well to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give our love to Pastor Mike and tell him that we're still living. Jesus is justice. Tanya, right. Tanya, I see you on there, girl. It was so good to see you today. And Neil Cox, good to see you. Doug, I hope you're doing okay. We're praying for you. Yes. Oh, thank you so much, Roger. No, no uh -oh. school here. The coronavirus is hit again. Uh oh. Oh yeah. wow. Wow. How are you? How's your husband doing? Uh, well, well, in Michigan, it's already 32 degrees for a high. <laughs> <laughs> so pa Paul's wow. out there. Humbly serving and fixing people's heat. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Amen. Who is he? They, they put, uh, he put in the air conditioning unit um, at, 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 and then fix the one here up there. Okay, so, okay. It's still so, All right, y'all. I'll see you next week. Well, Loretta, right. I, I see Loretta. She, uh, she keep going back and forth, y'all. So pray, pray next week that she'll be to uh, be with us. Uh, she, did she talk? Did y'all remember her talking about it last week? Where she Loretta, uh, Loretta, Loretta Roll. Okay. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. From uh, from uh, Columbus. Yes. All right, All right y'all. It's so it was so good. Oh, today was just so good. I just don't want this to end, but I know it has <laughs> some people got stuff to do. <laughs> but this was just so good. <laughs> so. All right, y'all. I love y'all. Y'all have a good uh, rest of the week. Right, y'all. Ma mama, everybody's talking to you. Wave, you on mute. She, well, she don't, I have to go in there and unmute her, but I hear her saying something. So, um, all, all right, right. bye-bye. All right, bye-bye, y'all. Bye. -bye,